Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is the uh, MOC MC3 Perinatal Mini Series Part 4. So, this is our uh, fourth and final installation of the series. And today, the topic is going to be postpartum continuation and transitions of care for perinatal patients. Um, my name is Joanna Smith. I'm a behavioral health consultant with the uh, Michigan Opioid Collaborative. I cover the Southeast Michigan region, and I'm also joined by a few other colleagues, um, one of which is Megan Collette. She is the behavioral health consultant for the Western region in Michigan. Um, as I mentioned, this is our fourth and final series, and we're going to have a presentation from Drs. Uh, Rena Menke and Nancy Renbugai. Uh, before we get started, I did just want to mention a couple things. If you could please sign into the chat with your full name, your email address, and the organization that you're with. That'll help us follow up with you in an email afterwards with the slides and any additional materials that we cover today. Please make sure that you're muted throughout the presentation. Uh, we will have time at the end to answer any questions. So if you have a question, please feel free to uh, submit that through the chat and uh, we'll take care of that at, during the Q&A session at the end. Um, if you, uh, well, I also wanted to let you know again that uh, we will be sending an email out to everybody afterwards with the slides and additional materials. And uh, due to this being the last in, uh, session, we don't have any other uh, sessions scheduled yet uh, for the perinatal series going forward, but we're in the final stages of finalizing that and planning going forward for that. So as soon as we finalize uh, the additional, uh, any other webinars or uh, perinatal roundtables that we're uh, gonna host for the rest of the year, we'll send that out to you all in an email. And please also keep an eye on our website and our events page where you can find out any upcoming perinatal sessions or any upcoming um, MOC events in general. I did just wanna give a shout out to everybody on the MOC, MC3 and Great Moms team that were part of putting this uh, series together. So thank you everybody that's listed here. And uh, before we do get started, did just wanna give a brief overview of what the Michigan Opioid Collaborative offers. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Megan to take care of that. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks, everybody, so much for joining us today. Um, we're excited to be wrapping up this series, and we hope that um, if you have any other follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us here at MOC or MC3. Um, just briefly, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is an interdisciplinary team supporting providers and communities to increase access to office-based addiction treatment, expand care, and improve quality of care with patients with opioid and other substance use disorders throughout the state of Michigan. MOC is a grant funded program through Blue Cross Blue Shield and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. We offer free same day consultation services to help provide evidence-based quality addiction treatment. Our team of specialists are available to help with patient case questions related to treatment and management of substance use disorders. MOC offers quarterly introduction to buprenorphine trainings, as well as webinars on a variety of educational topics such as addiction, stigma, substance use topics, and like today, our perinatal series. We also have a hepatologist on our team who offers hep C treatment consultation within 48 hours. She facilitates a bi-weekly case consultation webinar to review cases with providers and has developed a three-part webinar series on HCV treatment. We have created many toolkits for our providers around the state um, to have some more resources when treating patients with multiple SUDs, and those can all be found on our website. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative also has behavior health consultants around the state that are happy to facilitate trainings, answer questions, troubleshoot with technical assistance, and be an extra support for you and your organization and your community at large. Please feel free to chat, um, take a look at our website, um, click on our events tab, um, and some contact information is there as well. And we hope to see you all at a future event. Joanna, I'll give it back to you. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, we're also gonna post the link to our website in the chat in just a few moments. So feel free to check us out at that link. And before we do get started, I uh, did just wanna go over a brief poll with you all. So uh, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative has a new HIV initiative that's working on a new project around um, providing support around HIV and PrEP. We're hoping to gather some information um, to know the level or get an idea of the level of knowledge that providers and community partners might have around HIV and HIV treatments. So in just a moment, I'm gonna post a link to a brief Qualtrics survey in the chat 
I'm going to ask that everybody take a moment before the end of the presentation today to fill out that brief survey. The results that we gather from that is going to help inform our July 31st webinar on HIV and PrEP. So we're hope, we hope that you're, you're going to be able to complete that. Um, the last question that's listed on there is just for prescribers. So if you're not a prescriber, you can just skip over that and submit your answers. Uh, towards the end of today's presentation, I'll post the survey answers in the chat just for your own reference. Um, so I'll go ahead and post the link. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Rena. Thanks, Joanna and Megan. So my name is Rena Menke, and I am a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry. And Nancy and I are going to be going through and sharing a bit with you today about um, the postpartum period and supporting women. So just bear with me for a minute while I share my screen. I was telling Joanna and Megan earlier, I'm used to having multiple screens. So today is a single screen day. <laughs> so I have to figure out how to do this and see everything. There we go. All right. Um, are you guys seeing the actual slides and not my notes? Okay. So um, as I said, today, Nancy and I will be talking and sharing with you a little bit about the importance of um, postpartum continuation and transitions of care um, for women with opioid use disorders. Our objectives are to identify mental health needs of birthing parents during the postpartum period, identify the importance of continuation of care, identify programs that can sort, support parents, and then also talk about um, transitions in care and provide some guidelines. Let me just rearrange my screens a little bit because there are a couple things being covered up here. All right, there we go. Okay, so when we think about what is happening for individuals in the postpartum period, what we wanna do is we wanna think about what are all of the different needs that people are presenting with. Um, there are so many different needs for people. First, we need to consider mental health screening. We also need to consider whether or not trauma has occurred for the person and how we can address that. Also thinking about parenting um, and then medical and life issues helping connect individuals to resources and then talking through transitions to care. So I'm gonna dig into each of these to give a little bit more context as we move through. So what we know is that oftentimes substance use is develops in the context of mental health concerns, but also in the context of trauma. If we look at the statistics related to this, what we often see is that 80% of women with a substance use history have a lifetime history of trauma. That is pretty significant. Um, and then 30 to 60% of women with PTSD have a substance use disorder. And there's a significant overlap between PTSD and depression symptoms. So it highlights the a pretty strong need to screen for mental health concerns and then also think about trauma um, all in the context of substance use disorders. If we wanna take a developmental perspective, it's even more important to be able to address and, Oh, sorry, I hear somebody. Okay, there we go, I think we're good. Um, so if we think about a developmental perspective, oftentimes what happens is individuals are exposed early on in life to substance use um, prenatally. So if someone is exposed prenatally to substances, they then have later um, more, they have a higher chance of then later developing substance use disorders. And along that pathway, what we often have too is early adversity in the term in in terms of um, child abuse. Um, we also have executive functioning difficulties, self regulation, and all of these together then develop into ongoing cycles of, of substance use. Um, I'm sharing here just a thumbnail of a of a prior presentation to to highlight the importance of mental health screening during this time because we can see there are pretty high rates of mental of depression, um, generalized anxiety disorder, and PTSD. Um, I, you will have in the slides a link to the prior conversation and presentation by Dr. Music. Um, so you, if you want to learn a bit more about these, you're welcome to go there. We also have at MC3 a perinatal provider toolkit that gives more information with different resources that you can use to help identify mental health concerns for people. And all of these are important and because mental health concerns are one of the leading factors contributing to maternal mortality during the postpartum period throughout the United States. So as you can see here, um, the, the leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths 
um, is that are determined to be preventable is mental health conditions. So what this also then leads to is looking at the, the pregnancy associated death specifically in Michigan. And what we can see here is that in Michigan, substance use disorder is the um, leading cause of pregnancy associated, not related to pregnancy um, from maternal mortality. And suicide is also 4.5%. So if we combine, combine the mental health concerns of substance use disorder and suicide, there's a pretty strong indication that we need to pay attention to these pieces to help prevent maternal mortality. And then taking into account trauma is also a, a very strong predictor of um, suicide deaths during the postpartum period. So a history of domestic violence and a child protective services involvement um, are also related to this. And we need to consider how trauma impacts individuals' experience of the world and how they are uh, interacting with the world. So it's important at, at a number of levels. First, if an individual has a history of childhood experiences, they may then start, they're more vulnerable to depression, um, they're more vulnerable to substance use, they're more vulnerable to divorce, having mental illness, potential incarceration. Um, there's also associations between adverse community environments and um, later development of mental health concerns as well. It also, at an individual level, it impacts how people think about the world, it impacts how they think about themselves, it impacts how they behave in the world, and then it also impacts how they interact with other people. So trauma has a huge impact in terms of how people are in the world and how they cope. And breaking it down further, when we think about information processing, trauma can impact how what people remember, how people remember it, their ability to organize information, their ability to focus, their ability to utilize language, um, and also being able to engage in their environment in ways that, that feel comfortable to them. And this manifests in their behavior. If people are easily startled or hypervigilant, they may lash out when touched. They may have bigger reactions than would be expected. They may be reactive to triggers um, or distracted by internal triggers. They may have poor sleeping. Um, they may not be able to fall asleep. They may not be able to stay asleep because they're waking up due to nightmares. And they may also be seeking safety or control, which sometimes is mimicked as anxiety or an OCD behaviors. And they may engage in high risk behaviors like substance use, cutting, um, or increase in indiscriminate behaviors. And then it impacts relationships. So a person may be less available in their relationships. They might again be more irritable, they might withdraw. They may not be able to understand other people's perspective or experiences and be able to connect with them. They may be clingy and they may need to know where people are. They may have need to have a sense of controlling their environment. So as professionals, what we can do is we can integrate trauma informed um, practices to be able to support individuals. And so in doing that, we can acknowledge that trauma is fairly prevalent. We can create safety by slowing down, listening, supporting, reflecting what's happening for people, and, and noticing when maybe we're making assumptions about what's happening for a person. We can be trustworthy and dependable, showing up when we say we're going to show up, um, and, and, and delivering on what we said we were going to do. We can collaborate and empower individuals by asking questions, seeking to understand what's happening for them, and providing compassion and empathy. And then what's oftentimes not attended to as much is for us as professionals to take care of ourselves and to be able to prevent burnout. So doing things, us doing things that we enjoy to help restore us, because as we're able to take care of ourselves, we're then able to be present for individuals and for people. Another piece that we wanna think about for birthing parents is parenting. And so um, I'm gonna, talk a little bit before I go into parenting. I want to talk a, a touch about, I'm trying to so I can see. Okay, it's going to go. There we go. Okay. So 
Um, just to, to orient everyone to thinking about um, the brain processes and um, of addiction. So all drugs of abuse increase dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which normally mediates responses to natural reinforces, forcers like food, sex, and social interactions, including parenting. So in a not addicted brain, activities cause pleasure leading to a release in dopamine and then the desire to repeat the activity. In brains that are addicted, the drug directly releases dopamine and that then causes a desire to use the drug over again. And I'm pulling this from a talk that Dr. Jonathan Morrow just recently did a few weeks ago for MOC. Um, I, the YouTube link is here if you guys would like to see this. But I think as, as I was watching that and listening and processing for this presentation, I was able to connect it and thinking through parenting within itself is oftentimes an inherently pleasurable experience. It's also very difficult. And so as individuals are parenting, what could happen with drug use is the infants um, will create a signal. So let's thinking about babies. Um, you know, they're born, they're cute, they've got these big eyes, round faces, we want to snuggle them. Um, and I am an infant mental health person, so that's why you're seeing me get excited here, because I love babies. <laughs> um, and so babies are just intrinsically, you know, little people that draw us to them. And that is an evolutionarily based piece of, of being human. Infants need parents to take care of them. They need people to take care of them. They can't do that on their own. So with addiction, many times what happens is that process of having an in inherent um, dopamine release of interacting with an infant has been circumvented by abusing um, substances or using substances. So the infant may signal with a smile, they may signal with eye contact, they may signal with crying, they may signal with whatever their behavior is that they're trying to interact with a parent. And that reaction may not then have the same response if a parent hasn't been using substances. And that could then result in um, reduced engagement in terms of the parent. And then the parent is, is not um, maybe passive um, or not interacting with the child. The other piece that ends up happening with parenting is parenting is also inherently stressful. So a parent who is using substances may become more reactive when they have a cue that is like maybe the baby crying. Um, that could then drive a parent to have an increase in craving. Um, and then the parent may relapse. So when we look at the research among um, individuals with a history of addiction, what we do see is that parents um, who use substances have less positive parenting behaviors, so less warmth. Um, they have less parenting sensitivity, less involvement. And then they also have more negative parenting behaviors. So there may be more harshness, um, more humiliation of the child. And this is the piece that I think is really important is thinking about parents' beliefs about themselves. Um, and we know with, with years of cognitive behavioral therapy that many times we can target people's beliefs and thoughts and help them to modify those thoughts to empower them to be able to care for their children and to be present for their children. Um, and then another piece that happens for parents is that they have difficulties balancing their own needs and balancing their children's needs. And we do see that kids um, with parents who have a history of opioid abuse have fewer academic and cognitive skills. They may have more difficulties interacting socially and they're at higher risk for psychopathology. So again, going back to that developmental perspective I highlighted at the beginning, we see that coming through. So what this means is that individuals need trusting relationships. They need people they can go to, they can talk to about what's happening for them. We need to be able to promote maternal infant bonding. So having parents connect with their infants in a way that feels good for them and helping them to identify their infant's behaviors and pay attention to their infant's behaviors and interpret their infant's behaviors. Another piece is initiating breastfeeding if it's desired and supporting breastfeeding if it's desired. And this is all in the context of, a, of attending to preventing relapse during the postpartum period. 
I'm gonna let Nancy talk a bit about this slide. Um, before I start on this one, um, what Raina said is, is so important because uh, I don't know how many of you out there have uh, adopted the Eat Sleep Console um, as a way of, of keeping babies and moms together um, of opiate use disorder, um, moms after they deliver. And ours is uh, Eat Sleep Console. We at um, Corwell Health, we keep the patient and the baby together for five days. Uh, they stay in the room two days after vaginal birth um, or uh, three days after a C-section. And at that time, uh, if the baby is not having any withdrawal issues, um, the mother is discharged from the room and then the baby is admitted to the room. And so um, because of the need for bonding and, and the help that gives uh, a mother with an OUD, um, it just really has proven to be uh, a great um, way of handling uh, the postpartum period after, after the birth of the baby. So, um, so as far as medical issues and life issues, we, you know, we talked about that a little bit, um, but on a normal um, patient that has no trauma and, you know, does not have an SUD, um, you know, the medical issues might jump in there. And, and so we have to consider those as far as supporting moms. Um, if a mother is hemorrhaged after birth, she's going to have a hemoglobin that's very low. She's going to be very tired and having a hard time, you know, uh, taking care of her child. Um, hypertension, if, if they've had a hypertensive crisis or they've had um, preeclampsia, you know, they're going to have their, have to have their um, hypertension watched over a little bit close, closer. Gestational diabetes should resolve, but diabetes continues on. And so on top of caring for a baby and getting up every two to three hours, they have to be watching their blood sugars. And, and so this is another just a, a great stressor on them. Uh, thyroid, if I have hypothyroid, I know if my thyroid's not right, I, I, can't get out of bed. So um, watching that and making sure they're right on the correct dose to, to support them there. Um, and one of the greatest issues, I think, not the greatest, but one of one of the big issues that uh, I have with the patients I care for is pain after surgery. If someone's in recovery, they're hypersensitive to taking opiates after um, a C-section or a tra traumatic birth. And they do not want anything to do with being on any kind of oxycodone or narco. And so managing that pain, uh, what we do at Corwell, I, I think pretty much probably most of the hospitals do this now, but um, we give Motrin and Tylenol around the clock. Um, it's not a PRN, it's not, are you in pain? You know, we'll give you some of this. It's scheduled around the clock, both, um, Motrin and Tylenol. And we really have found that our patients uh, that have had C-sections have had their pain very well controlled. Um, but we do tell them if you need Oxy, that's what you need. And you are likely going to need a little bit more because we don't want you to be stressed um, from the pain because that's just another stressor on top of that. So um, then you have um, the life issues, you know, history of depression. So uh, we know just normally a, a woman that has a history of depression is more likely to have postpartum depression. So if you have uh, an OUD or SUD, that just is compounded um, with the history of depression. Um, interpersonal violence, you know, it's, it's stressful. Sometimes the um, parents uh, are not together on the parenting, uh, you know, care and the, um, person caring for the baby sometimes is not well supported. And uh, I know a lot of, I mean, we've had situations where uh, the partner has, has wanted to be a little bit more in the spotlight and the baby takes that away. And so that sort of leads to um, emotional abuse. So, uh, you know, life situations like that are really stressful. Just a, just a stressful life, you know, um, like Rena said, you know, um, a lot of times, um, at least my patients, some of them have great jobs and they're there, but some of them don't have jobs. And so uh, they, they're living with their parents or they don't know where they're living or they're um, 
they don't have a place to live and they're pregnant and they're waiting to have this baby. Um, and, you know, the last one fear of CPS uh, taking their children becomes a real, real stressor that, you know, can lead them to um, relapse and go to um, previous use. Um, also poor social support. If you have parents that have addiction issues, um, you know, there can be a lot of relationship issues, um, or if, even if parents don't have those, um, and you, uh, a, a person gets involved in that, sometimes, you know, parents are like, I, I don't want you in my house, you can't be in here, I don't want people using, and so then they find themselves not being supported that way, and then um, poor financial support, you know, a lot of times, like I said, they can't work, and so all these things sort of add on top of having an OUD or an SUD and sort of um, make the, the patient more likely to go back to previous use. So all these things have to be considered. Thanks, Nancy. Well, what I wanna do is I wanna bring us some hope because <laughs> there are <laughs> lots of different programs that help support moms and help support their babies and, and help them during this period of time. So I wanna share with you a couple of programs that, um, that I'm involved in, in uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm not gonna go into as much as MOC because um, Joanna and Megan shared a bit about that, but MOC is available to support you guys and to support you in terms of any questions you have um, and concerns you have. I am going to go into a little bit more detail about um, Mom Power um, and a recently funded health endowment fund project that we're doing at the University of Mich Michigan in Corwell East. Um, but also our MC3 program that's available. So Mom Power is a 13-week manualized attachment-based trauma-informed parenting and mental health intervention, and it's a mouthful. Um, and it's not only a mouthful, but it is a tall order um, because it is a program that provides, it's, it's trauma-informed and in that it provides a really nice, safe place for women to come, talk about what they're struggling with, and it helps to give them an understanding, a, a, a nice understanding of um, attachment and how it plays out with, within their relationships and with their relationships with their children. Um, the Mom Power program uses a tree, um, and, and I often, I'll use my hands to demonstrate the tree um, because we talk about branching out opportunities um, for like helping support people to go out into the world, learn about things in the world, um, and, and the needs that are um, needed in relationships from that, but also building roots. So you can see the branching out and building roots for the two. Um, and so this is a really nice way of helping parents to understand what their, ch their children might be presenting to them with um, and helps to maybe modify some attributions that might be coming up for people. Um, it also has, so that you can see in this um, figure, the five pillars of mom power. So I highlighted that attachment-based parenting. It's also enhancing social support. So because it is a group setting, there are other women who are available to talk through, share their experiences and be able to, to support one another. We do during, um, during like a weekly check-in, we'll, we'll talk with women about what their needs are and how we can connect them to services. So helping them to get food, helping connect them to WIC, um, helping connect them. We've, we've even had services where we've helped people to connect with um, insurance, like maybe switching from one type of insurance to another type of insurance, whatever it is that the woman is coming and saying, I need help with this so that it can help to mitigate and reduce their stress. Um, Mom Power right now, most of the programs are being run virtually. Um, and in the past, when they have been in person, there's been, a, and it is attended to virtually as well. However, when it's been in person, um, there's been a, a, a a child team as well that goes along with the mom team. And in that, we're able to provide in vivo um, coaching to parents about interacting with their child and talking with parents about what they might see, what they may be seeing in their child's behavior, how they're interpreting that. And then we can help parents to then um, work on those thoughts about what they're seeing with their child and supporting their child. 
also every single week in Mom Power, we talk about self care. And so, self care in terms of what helps to restore a mom, what helps her to feel regulated, what helps her to be able to move forward and continue to be the parent that she wants to be. Um, it's there's so much more to share about Mom Power, but hopefully that's a thumbnail. If you guys are interested in more, I can give you the website for it so you can look it up. Um, but it's it's a very it's an amazing program that um, has been able to support women with histories of trauma. And we have received funding, or Dr. Music um, and Dr. Swain have received funding to be able to implement. Um, mom power with individuals during the postpartum period um, to support uh, to support OUD. So, and it's a, it's a brain behavior um, project. So women are starting the program, um, they're getting EEGs. Um, some of the prior research on mom power has shown that women who complete the mom power program have an increased um, uh, amygdala action when they see pictures of their child. So they have a stronger empathic response essentially when they are engaging with um, representations of their children. So essentially what that means is we would, we would expect more positive caregiving, more positive interactions with their children and being able to support them. So and the other program I mentioned is the Health Endowment Fund recently um, supported program. And this is in, a, in collaboration with Corwell East and the Maternal Fetal Medicine Program at the University of Michigan. And um, it's being embedded within the Partnering for the Future Clinic. And so essentially what we are doing with this project is we have a, um, the Partnering for the Future Clinic is a clinic where individuals with a history of substance use disorder go during pregnancy and they're able to have their methadone um, monitored over time. Um, people are then getting an anesthesia consult um, to be able to think about what is their birth plan going to be, how are they going to manage pain during birth the birthing process, and they are also synchronously referred to the MC3 program for perinatal patient care. So I'll talk a little bit more about perinatal patient care in a second, but um, across these three programs, so the Partnering for the Future Clinic, across anesthesiology and MC3, women have multiple touch points where they're being um, supported and encouraged to be able to get their needs met and, and to help them to be able to move through this stressful period of time. So MC3 is a psychiatry support for Michigan providers. Um, and our vision in MC3 is to promote perinatal mental health by supporting providers and providing same day access to mental health screening and treatment for perinatal patients in Michigan. So as part of MC3, what we have available are two different types of services. There are provider consultations and there is patient care. So the provider consultation is a same day phone call to a hotline um, that professionals are able to call and see whether or not they help, have help with a differential diagnosis, recommendations for um, medications, get resources for parents, um, and then also learn a little bit more about what therapy options might be available in communities. And then also we have, um, we're currently working on a a patient facing um, toolkit so that parent or providers are able to provide a patient with like these are different strategies you might be able to to work through so we're finalizing that packet right now or toolkit. The consultation request can be initiated by anyone in the practice um, and it can be submitted by phone or online. Um, the psychiatrist will give a call back to a provider if with recommendations, particularly if it's about a medication question. Um, and then the MC3 behavioral health consult is kind of the liaison in all of this, and they can provide consultation to local resources. So the other thing that I, I want to emphasize is that um, the individuals who are MC3 behavioral health consultants are situated across the state of Michigan. So they are connected with local resources in many different ways. Um, and they oftentimes know what is happening in the communities and they know the resources that are there. And then we communicate back with a written summary to the provider. 
So perinatal patient care is a service that we have been implementing since 2021. And I want to shout out to Lisa Anderson because I saw her jump on and she is one of our behavioral health care, our behavioral health consultants. Um, and perinatal patient care is currently only available within Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, Genesee, Ingham, and Washtenaw counties. This is a pilot program that has been generously funded by the um, governor's budget, but also by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for us to provide screening and short-term therapy to women. We are using the remote collaborative, uh, remote collaborative care model, which is an integrated behavioral health program. Um, so we collaborate with OBs to be able to provide um, case management, care coordination, therapy, um, and then we are able to interact with patients using uh, phone calls, text, emails, video chat, whatever they really prefer to be able to, to interact. So if you are in one of those regions, um, Southeast Michigan or Ingham County or Genesee County, um, what the referral process is, is that a provider informs patients of, of the MC3 perinatal patient care services. The patient scans a QR code or goes to the website and completes an e-screening. And then we get the referral and we reach out to the individual to create a custom care plan. So we typically do an interview with the person and then um, we meet with our, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, we reach out to the person within 24 hours of getting the referral to help support them. And I'll tell you about more process next with our figure. So this is the collaborative care model. Um, and so essentially what this is describing is, is that we have a pr primary care provider who is the OB who um, provides the information to the patient. Um, the patient then connects with our programming and our behavioral health care manager reaches out to the patient. Um, the behavioral health care manager does an interview with the patient to learn about what's going on. Um, and then after that interview, they meet with a psychiatric consultant. So we have two psychiatric consultants right now, Dr. Ashraf and Dr. Shaw. The psychiatric consultant is able to share um, any medication recommendations, any treatment recommendations that they have, and our behavioral health care managers then loop back to the primary care provider to say, this is what we're thinking about um, and how, how we can collaborate to support this individual. So I actually talked about patient care first. Um, so you can see like this connection um, between the, the BHC the patient and the primary care provider to support the patient. The provider consultation is the primary care provider calls our provider consultation hotline, and then they're connected through the a BHC to the psychiatric consult. So it's the psychiatric consult directly going to the primary care provider. Oop, there we go. Um, so there's a couple of options based on what works in different clinics and based on their workflow that you guys have access to and based on Locale, location. So in terms of impact, what we're finding is that people are really happy with the services that they're getting from the perinatal patient care. Um, so you can see that the one person said, the time that the BHC spends talking to me and really getting to know me and the things I'm needing help with has been priceless. She's helped me get a therapist for long-term. She's got my doctor to understand my medical needs with medication and hooked me up getting into physical therapy. I'd recommend it to anyone in need. And then another person said, for the first time, I found someone who has a way of understanding me and helping me understand and see things in a whole new way. I'm able to take a step back, dissect how and why I'm feeling the way that I am. And the BHC has been a lifesaver and is truly incredible at what she does. And what's even more remarkable is, as we've been looking at um, depression and anxiety over time, and what we're seeing is a 50% reduction, reduction in clinical levels of depression and anxiety for individuals coming into the services. So we know that these services are making a huge impact for individuals. So I'm gonna just stop here for a second. Um, if you guys are signed up for MC3, fantastic. If you're not, scan this QR code, you'll also get it in the slides, um, but we would love to be able to support you in your practices. And then here is our team. Dr. Music is our perinatal director. Dr. Shaw is one of our consulting psychiatrists. We have lots of amazing people on our team. 
All right, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. And Nancy, just let me know when you want me to, to move forward. OK. Um, well, I will say that MC3, for, um, for me as an OB provider, uh, it's it's amazing because um, a lot of times you have these patients and you're OB, you don't know, you're not a psychiatrist and um, you know a little bit about mental health and, and that, and, and you know what meds maybe to start a patient on. Um, but if, it, if it's a little bit more complicated, if you have like bipolar or, or personality disorder or something like that, um, as an OB, you're just sort of stuck and you, and, and you don't know what to do. So this is a great service as far as I'm concerned. Um, and what I wanna talk about is the need to continue uh, MOUD for patients that are currently um, have an issue with an OUD and, and are being um, given uh, Suboxone or Methadone or those type of things. Um, a lot of um, moms, when they come to us and find out they're pregnant, the first thing they say is, how do I get off of this stuff? And um, I, if you've listened to any of the perinatal um, presentations, you know that we don't uh, recommend any one step uh, treatment in the middle of their pregnancy because it can cause uh, issues, um, you know, with uh, like maybe pregnancy loss, preterm labor and that type of thing. So we really suggest that they continue that. And that sort of goes into the postpartum period too. So. Next slide, no, next slide. <laughs> so once again, we talked about this a little bit, you know, about the stressors. Um, and if you, if you are gonna try to start weaning off of your um, medication for your OUD, all this is gonna even uh, be worse. And, and you're more likely to relapse if you um, don't, don't have the support of the medication. And so uh, we call this the fourth trimester after they deliver. And for most of us, um, we say for that first year, you, you shouldn't change anything. If you're on some type of a mental health medication, you should stay on it. You know, if you are on um, a medication for OUD, you should say, stay on it. You should not um, try to come off of it as soon as you have your baby, because that will that, that gives you a greater risk of, of going back to previous use. And um, some of the stressors um, after you have the baby is, you know, a lot of our uh, moms, um, their, their babies have to go to the NICU and that becomes a difficult situation because the babies are in the NICU and maybe they can't get to the hospital, they don't have transportation, they have other children, they, um, you know, that can't take, and no one to take care of them. Um, so that sort of pulls away from their bonding with their baby. And um, so it, it becomes very stressful for them. So staying on their medications will help keep them stable during this time. And um, CPS, we know that everybody, you know, moms that are involved in any kind of SUD worry about CPS taking their, their babies away. And um, we reassure them that if they're in care for their um, SUD, uh, you know, CPS looks at as they're in treatment and they're stable. So we really talk them into continuing that treatment and then staying on treatment. Um, and then, uh, you have the stigma and the judgment. Um, we didn't go into that very much, but in the past presentations we did. Um, and so they feel like they're judged because their baby is in the NICU. And so that just adds more um, stress on them and the more likelihood that if they don't stay on their medication, um, they will relapse and, and go into previous use. Okay, next. So I pretty much said a lot of this, but one thing we do know that they're higher risk for postpartum depression and increased risk of suicide. And uh, I wanted to make sure that um, I really uh, stressed that if you didn't see Dr. Music's um, presentation in uh, the series three, um, it's, it's a really good presentation on, on the risk of suicide. And uh, I watched that before, um, you know, uh, thinking about what I wanted to talk to uh, talk about, and um, and it's it's really good presentation. So, uh, and then 
counseling, the support. We may not have the program you have uh, over on the uh, east side of the state, but we can always send people for uh, counseling. Uh, also, um, you know, if, if people can get into the um, having someone support them through their journey and of, of their um, OUD and, and stand by them as a recovery coach, that is really helpful also. Um, and just being stable in their treatment is uh, really important. So next slide. So um, one of the, these are the kind of, kind of things that uh, we need to make sure that we um, provide during pregnancy. And I don't know if there's any nurses out there, but many years ago, 40 some years ago, well, maybe 30 some years ago, um, in my bachelor's degree, I had to pick a nurse theorist. And my nurse theorist that I picked was Jean Watson. And she said, caring is curing. And uh, so I've sort of followed that my whole entire life, that part of your caring is caring for especially um, these patients. So uh, the other thing um, that we do is we see the patient back. If they're fairly stable, we see them back in a couple of weeks, but always in two weeks, because those first two weeks are a big transition. Um, and you don't wanna wait for six weeks um, to see them. You wanna see them back in, in one to two weeks. Um, depending on what you're doing, we're trying to talk more OB um, providers into prescribing uh, Suboxone during pregnancy and not making the patient go to an MAT provider. Um, some aren't comfortable with that, then we will help with that if anybody wants to start that process. Um, but, uh, you know, you need to have the patient sign a release of information specifically about their substance use disorder and the ability to talk to their um, MAT provider. And whoever you have in your uh, office, whether it's a nurse or um, an MA or who, whoever supports you, should get that information and make sure you're able to contact, uh, contact that MAT provider because after birth, um, if you're caring for the patient, we suggest that you keep the patient for up, probably up to 12 weeks to provide um, their medication uh, for their OUD. Uh, during pregnancy, everybody knows um, if you've had a baby, uh, you really sort of bond with your o OB provider. And so this is a way of just helping um, keep that relationship going and making sure the patient's stable in those first three months. Um, if that's something you can't do in your office, then someone should make a call to the um, MAT provider and make sure that patient has an appointment uh, to see that uh, MAT provider so she has the continuity of care of getting back um, to that provider and, and uh, keeping on their medication. So, um, you know, arranging for counseling, like I told you about that, and and connecting for resources, being non-judgmental. Many patients um, go back to previous use, and it's really important to be um, supportive and use a harm reduction uh, model um, to start them back up and reassure them that they can get um, back back to taking their medication and and getting back to that stable life they were living, and then. Um, you know, the, the counselors, I, we need to have social workers in every single office. Unfortunately, um, that's not the priority, but if I was up there in higher office, I'd make sure that that was true. Um, and, uh, and then I said, you know, make sure the MAT provider is, um, is connected with the patient. And she doesn't just, I think in, in the past, what had happened is um, OBs were taking care of the OB part of it. MAT providers were taking care of the MAT part of it. The patient would deliver, the, they would see the patient back in six weeks. And during that six, uh, six week, all these stressors that we talked about before um, would unfortunately put them at risk for um, returning to you. So um, make sure you're connecting with them and, and sort of watching over them a little bit closer um, than your other patients. Um, okay, next slide. I'm just going to repeat a hundred times. <laughs> uh, if 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 they're taken off this medication, they're they're more at risk for suicide. They're more at risk for relapse, and um, they just should never be taken off. A, lo a lot of um, uh, you know providers think that that might be an option, 
but that really uh, should not be an option. And if for some reason the patient really, really is committed and stable and wants to do that, they should be with uh, a knowledgeable MAT provider that knows how to wean them off very, very slowly. Um, so 12, for a whole year, just tell them, I tell them to just set, set tight, take their medications. If they're on any mental health medications, stay on those mental health medications, get all the help they can, get stable. And um, then at that point, you know, uh, we can work at maybe starting to take some of that away if they feel like they, they are stable enough. So that was just my, my, uh, my message to everyone. So nobody starts talking about um, stopping any of their medications after they deliver. So that's me. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Nancy. And so um, you will have our contact information in the slides that you get. Dr. Poland and Dr. Music, um, along with Nancy and myself, uh, um, strongly influenced the development of this talk today. So if you also are interested or wanting to reach out to them, their information is going to be on here. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and so I know that there are a few questions out there. And so I'm gonna ask Joanna, thank you for managing the chat for us while we were doing this. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you to ask, and then we can answer them. Sure thing. So some of the questions that came in, at least one of them was, how did you get your hospital to agree to doing the five-day rooming together? Well, uh, the NICU nurses went to uh, sort of a uh, you know, presentation on it, um, and they were all behind it. Um, we know that bonding with the baby is so important and they just backed us up. They backed us up that that's something that we needed to do. Uh, it kept the babies, most of our babies that are on Suboxone um, do not have to go up to the NICU. They, they don't go through withdrawal, but the, it's sort of, um, I don't want to say mandated, but sort of mandated that they stay at least five days because, you know, the first couple of days after birth, you're not, you might not see, um, withdraw from the baby. So you want at least five days to observe the baby and to have the, our NICU is insanely crazy, you know, and for something like this, the best place for this um, baby to be is in the mother's arms. And so uh, you just have to really talk to the powers that be and, and uh, work to make that happen. They were pretty, they, they were open to it. So Nancy, do you want to, I'm so sorry, I don't, I don't feel very well at Scare Poland, but Nancy, do you want to talk a little bit about um, our, the, the, the um, committee, because I think that that was oh, a really great yeah. centralizing point to, to, to yeah. get by and, and, and have a united front in terms of the proposal to the different stakeholders, whether it was profession stakeholders, the yeah. physicians, the social workers, the nurses, or the departmental stakeholders, the OB, pediatrics, neonatology. Mm -hmm. um, we had representation from all of those groups. Yeah, well, and, and when we started out seven years ago, we, we started the Great Moms Program and we were all involved in the outpatient care. And, and then all of a sudden we went, oh yeah, that's right, they go inpatient. Maybe we should start working on that. So we got a committee together from inpatient and it was NICU, MFM, our committee, um, uh, uh, CNS that's from the hospital. And we'd meet uh, once a month on a Tuesday and we'd hammer out some of these issues. And so by doing that, we did have some of the stakeholders in, in those meetings. And so it made, a lot, it made it a lot easier. And once NICU said, hey, this is working and this is what we need to do. Since we had that committee going, we had a lot of people that supported us with that. I Great, thank really, you so much. A really big turning point too was when you know we were able to parade around the fact that the, the NICU said they wished everybody with substance use went through our program. It really mm -hmm. pushed, I think, the OB providers, the community-based providers. We had folks that weren't within our system on the committee. Um, so we had like folks from some of the CMH associated um, support services like family engagement teams and methadone clinic. And once they all started hearing about it, it was like they were they were knocking down our door to, to get people in. And it really wasn't us saying, hey, we're providing this service. It was the NICU doc saying, hey, this service is valuable. <laughs> um, that, that I think changed some of the conversation there. 
Great, thank you both. Uh, the next question that came in was, what do you suggest for non-opioid pain relief during labor? Oh, I don't think I can really speak to that. I'm telling you, um, most of our patients um, get um, an epidural. You know, we sort of um, suggest that they get one because they're gonna, their pain is gonna be at a higher level than someone who's not on um, a treatment for OUD. And pretty much, I, I mean, just in general, patients that go into Corwell Health, I, I think there's like 95% of them that, you know, they get their um, epidurals. Um, but I know there's ways, maybe Kira, I mean, I think, I think they can use some medications to help. They can't use the buprenorphine or the Stadol, not the buprenorphine, um, uh, you know, uh, the Stadol type medications, Nubane, um, cause it'll throw the patient into um, withdrawal. Um, but I think they can, some people use, I think a little fentanyl. I don't know. I can't really address that in patients. So, so, so people, so people who are in MOUD are not precluded from receiving opioid analgesics right. for, for the acute labor part of their delivery. And that is absolutely the recommendation um, is to provide them with a adequate and appropriate analgesia. Um, so we want to do all the same opioid sparing um, opportunities that we provide to uh, all of our patients should be available as well to patients with a history of a substance use disorder who are on MOUD. Um, as Nancy mentioned, uh, people's pain threshold, their, their, their brains are sensitized a bit to pain, so their pain threshold um, is lower. And what that means is if I took somebody on MOUD and I took somebody not on MOUD and I put their hands in a bucket of ice water, this is what the study, this is the study that they did, right? Um, and asked them to keep their hand in the bucket as long as they could, um, they uh, are likely to pull their hand out of that bucket it, faster if they're on MOUD than not. So their perception of pain is actually literally that the pain is worse than somebody who's not on MOUD. So not providing appropriate adequate analgesia is absolutely inappropriate for people um, that are receiving MOUD. In um, the Great Moms Toolkit, which is on MOC's website, there is a protocol available. Um, please feel free to steal, utilize, implement in your own hospital system. There's not a lot of data um, on, you know, exactly what to do. Um, the limited data is that if somebody is on less than 12 milligrams of buprenorphine, you can increase the dose and frequency of the buprenorphine to provide some appropriate analgesia in the postpartum period. Um, otherwise, you can generally expect people to need one and a half to two times the doses that you would expect in somebody who is opioid naive. Again, it's because they have that uh, sensitization. The most important thing is to remember that we do not we do not stop the buprenorphine um, in order to provide that. We wanna continue the buprenorphine. Um, but again, there's more information in the toolkit. And if uh, people want to discuss that further with the team, um, you know, the, the BHEs can help us arrange for, um, arrange for a more in-depth conversation. Thank you so much. Rena, we did have a couple questions directed your way. Uh, does the provider, regarding MC3, does the provider caller have to be an MD or an NP or could a therapist call and receive support? So therapists can call and they'll get access to the resources. Um, typically, I, I believe they can call and talk with psychiatrists, but typically it is preferable that a medical professional is calling to talk with a psychiatrist to get a um, recommendation for medications. Um, and, and so yes, your therapists are definitely welcome to call, ask and, and get support. Great, thank you. And then additionally with MC3, what credentials do the BHCs on your team have? Yeah, so our perinatal patient care um, professionals are all licensed state of Michigan mental health providers. We have LMSWs. Um, I'm, I'm one of the BHCs. I have a license in psychology. And then we have one LLP, um, which is a limited licensed psychologist. Um, so all of us are licensed mental health professionals. Thank and you. These, and then Sorry, go I, ahead. I see Lisa's. Lisa, send me a, a message because I'll send you some information you can, um, or in others too, if you're interested about information you can give to people to enroll. That would be fantastic. 
yeah, so I can I can direct some resources to you and to others if you're interested of how to refer to the program and use the, the program. Wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. I know we are coming up on time. We did have a couple additional questions, but I did just want to let everybody know if you have to hop off, no big deal. Thank you so much for joining us today. Like I said before, we will be following up with you in an email to send slides, material, and, and a, a, anything additional that we've covered during uh, today's topic. Um, so if you need to hop off, no big deal, but if you want to stick around, um, we do have just a couple more questions in our chat here. Um, so Rena, one more uh, question about MC3. Does MC3 work with residential care? Um, we have not interacted with residential care as much. Um, if you're if you're curious about interacting or collaborating in some way, reach out. Let's see what we might be able to do and how we might be able to think about it. Great, thank you. Um, we did get a just a general comment earlier about uh, this might be have been what Lisa wrote earlier, but um, this person said they spoke with Dr. Music about having the MC3 program available to HV programs directly. I think that might be home visiting programs. Um, so just saying that um, it's not been possible so far, but if the home visiting programs could get a referral form stating that they're incurred, encouraging the OB provider to make a referral to the MC3 program and how to do that, um, that would make things easier. Okay. Uh, and, okay. and then I put my email in there because I can send if you guys reach out to me, I can send you some of our marketing information about how to promote it with OBs. Um, this has been a, a conversation we've had with um, with particularly with region six um, and knowing that, you know, there's limited resources in the area and wanting um, to connect people to mental health resources. So happy to talk with you individually about that. Generally, what we do is we just um, share our marketing material with, with the home visitors who then can share it with patients and then the patient can take it to the provider um, and talk through it with the provider about you know, what can be helpful for them in terms of their mental health services. Great, thank you. And then um, lastly, we did get uh, just a add on to the question before about non opioid options during labor and delivery. This person asked, what if the client doesn't want opioids because they are afraid of relapse? Um, do uh, either of you have any recommendations around that? Well, you know, for us, uh, we usually, you have to address that with them um, and you can assure them that this is monitored and we give the lowest dose possible to keep them comfortable. Um, if they say there's just no way that um, I'm going to take anything like that, like I said, the epidural is a great way to go. I'm, you know, I'm a midwife. I didn't like epidurals when they came in in the 80s. I cried every night. But um, you know, for someone that does not want any medications whatsoever, um, the epidural is is a great way to go to keep them comfortable. Um, so, I mean, they can try everything else. Um, supposedly they can, they're not supposed to do the nitrous oxide, but you know, the, the bre breathing, you know, that they can do to calm down. But I know a lot of, a lot of our patients use that. So that's, that's a way to sort of, um, help them, you know, just use that, uh, nitrous to, to get through the bad times. Great, thank you. Well, that is everything that we received in the chat. Um, I know it's a little bit over time, but just wanted to thank you both so much for being able to present on this really important and fantastic topic today. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, as I mentioned, we'll reach out to you with a follow-up email. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and let us know. And uh, we hope to see you at some upcoming MOC MC3 events in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, bye.